what's left at the park. It's on there, it's like the second inning. Third inning, she shows up, sits down beside me and said, what's the score? I said, it's tied. There is no score. She said, great, I didn't miss anything. <laughs> We think about baseball. This next routine is one of the greatest uh, 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 verbal routines, first done by Happy Costello. A great comic routine. Who's on first? Bunts the ball. 
you get busy. That's right. And being a good catcher, I go and I scoop up the ball and I throw it to who? That's the first thing right you've said all the time. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Listen, I pick up the ball and I throw it to somebody. It bet somebody better be there. And whether it's who or why or what or naturally, I don't give a damn. Why he's the shortstop? Ah, oh, no. <laughs> he's the oh, what the hell? He's over the clock. <laughs>
September what? September 1st. We have a Virgo. He's really perfect in every way, don't you think? He thinks so. <laughs> and he expects everybody else to think so. But he is. He's a little bit on the anal side, but he's really grounded. He's earthbound. He knows right from wrong. He expects everybody else to know right from wrong. We need Virgos in this world. It's keeping us grounded. It's keeping us crazy on the ground. We have a wonderful life, Virgo. <laughs>
warm. It's about to get a little bit warmer, ladies and gentlemen, because our next act is uh, a lady who can really heat up any situation. So let's have a nice warm water bill tonight. Welcome for Linda the Torch. What torch?
straight down, put it in, and close your mouth. Do not hesitate.
and I'm practically rich. Yeah. <coughs> Nobody's home. Furniture's all gone. Oh, man. Note on the refrigerator. Bad. Now that scared me. The old note on the refrigerator. It's not a refrigerator note. Yes, it was. Oh, my God. I read it. Seven <laughs> arms. She said she didn't love me anymore. And she was going away and taking the baby. And leaving with my best friend. So what'd you do? I swore revenge. Yeah? Threw over the business. Took all my money out of my savings account. Yeah. Went on a worldwide expedition to find me. I was two weeks behind in Singapore. One week behind in Galveston, Texas. <laughs> Three days behind him in Milwaukee. <laughs> then at the gates of Calcutta. I saw him. Just as I was about to spring upon him, yeah. the sun was beating down so hot. Out of heat exhaustion, I fell at his feet. He passed out in pain. Well, well, yeah. But I come too, he was gone. <laughs> so, did you ever find him? I started off again. Then I finally found him at the brink of. Niagara Falls. There he was. I crept up on him. Slowly I turned. Step by step. I was so blood in my eyes. I grabbed him by the front. I threw him down. I jumped him.
conductor is the brain of a famous trial lawyer, won every case, very, very wealthy, intelligent man. I will transplant this brain for $15,000. The guy's got 10. What else you got, Doc? Well, we got this second brain, the brain of a famous surgeon, a wonderful man, devoted his entire life to humanity. I will transplant this brain for $25,000. Guy's getting worried. What else do you have, Doc? I have one more brain. It's right here. It's the brain of a cowboy. <laughs> the guy figures he's home free. <laughs> How much? Fifty thousand dollars for the cowboy's brain. Doc, wait a minute. Now come. You're gonna charge me. Twenty thousand for the lawyer and engineer. For the doctor is twenty thousand. And fifty thousand for the brain of a cowboy? <laughs> Why? The doctor said, because yeah, it's never been you. <laughs> Remember your childhood because here he is, Scoutmaster Bob. There you go, Bob. Thank you, young scout. <laughs> So this guy goes to a whorehouse. <laughs> he rings the doorbell. The madam comes downstairs. She opens the door. She can't believe this guy. This guy's got no arms and no legs. She says, what are you going to do here? He says, I rang the doorbell, didn't I? <laughs> I'm the only comic who doesn't get a drummer. Where's my drummer? We got any old scouts? Got any scouts here tonight? Any scouts? Any boy scouts? Yeah. Come on, get those hands up. Here's a little scout. Remember the Eagle scout oath? Eagle scout. Eagle scout. We got an eagle scout. All right. Another nerd. Do you remember the uh, scout oath? On my honor, I will do my best to help the Girl Scouts get undressed. How many remember that? There we go. Now he's with me. Scouting ain't like it used to be. You know, I'm a scout master, and it's tough to be scouts. Let me tell you, I feel like we're out in the danger field in the scout. <laughs> so scouts today, we take them on a camp out every month. Every month we take them back. Last month we took them out to the bitter root, or as we say in Scout 30, the bitter root. <laughs> we got this kid out here, and he's only a tenderfoot. He doesn't know. So he goes out with the patrol leader a senior patrol leader, and he's taking a, uh, a leak, as we like to say in the chew, and, uh, and he gets bit on his uh, hoo-ha, his wee-wing, his, uh, his all-purpose tool, as we like to call it at Troop 30, and uh, basically what happens is the senior patrol leader runs back to me and he says, Scoutmaster Pop, you won't believe this, but this little tenderfoot got bit right on the head of his inga. What am I going to do? It's a rattler. So, <laughs> being the scout master I am, I tell him, well, you know, what you got to do is you got to take your pocket knife. You go back there, you cut an incision right in the bite marks, and you suck out the blood. <laughs> <laughs> so the senior patrol leader runs back to his little tenderfoot. And he looks down at his tenderfoot, the tenderfoot looks up at him, and he says, where's scout master Bob? He says, scout master Bob's not coming. <laughs> well, what did he say? You're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of mayor badges that we give out in scouts, as you can tell. You got all these, you got your hiking, your canoeing, your camping, your stitching, your sex education right here on the love thing here. Uh, 
We got your Audubon Society bird thing here. And uh, you know, we teach our scouts about birds, and the way we do this is by word association. So for example, if I give you a word, like for example, wisdom, you would say to me, thinking about a bird, you would say to me, very, I see we got a lot of scouts in the audience tonight, huh? Very good. If I gave you, for example, the word love, you would say, thank you. Very good. And if I say to you true love, you would say, Ostrich. <laughs> 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 Swallow, that's correct. Give him a big hand. Yes. Thank you very much. You know, in scouting, as in life, we need to teach our scouts, you know, I mean, in the old days, you taught them about cooking canoeing. You taught them about hiking. Now we have sex education, Mary Batch. And you know, we teach our scouts about about preventive measures. We teach our, our kids about birth control. We teach them about the, the prophylactic, the pill, the rhythm method, and what Scoutmaster Bob likes to refer to as the bucket and saucer method. Now, a lot of you are not familiar with this, but in the Scouts we teach this because, as you can tell, I'm not a very tall guy. I'm only 5'8". And... Yeah. <laughs> Okay, give me 20 right now. Uh, and my wife, Betty, who is happens to be a den mother, and we call her den mother, Betty. She's 6'4", she's rather tall for age, and Scoutmaster Bob really enjoys having his sex, or as we like to call in Troop 30, our Bootsy Rara. Bootsy, 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 Rara! It's just a little something that we do in, uh, in Troop 30. Uh, Scoutmaster Bob likes having his Bootsy Rara standing up. So what so what Den Mother Betty does is she gets a bucket from out back of the house and she flips it over and Scoutmaster Bob he gets up on top of that bucket. <laughs> and he goes at it. <laughs> and when Scoutmaster Bob's eyes get as big as saucers, <laughs> Den Mother Betty kicks that bucket. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Yeah. We gotta play it up, we gotta play it up. We also have the sick and perverted joke merit badge. As you can see, I've got several of those on my sash here. Uh, you know, back in the old days of King Arthur, they had a different kind of contraceptive. It was called a chastity belt. Now, what King Arthur did is when he took off from the kingdom, he took a long trip and he left. Queen Genevieve, with all the knights, he put on that chassis belt, but he devised a chassis belt that was very un unusual. You could insert your key, your key, your all-purpose utility, and, but if you pulled it out, you might get it chopped off, and that's the way he designed it, so he could find out who was fooling around when he got back to the kingdom. So when he came back, he got all the knights together, just before the big banquet, and he asked them all to pull down their pants. Well. There were quite a few hacked off woogies, to say the least. And when he got to Sir Lancelot, he noticed that his member was intact. And he said, Sir Lancelot, you of all the knights here, you're the most loyal, you're the most dependable, you're the most trusted. To you, I bequeath my entire kingdom. What do you have to say to that? And Sir Lancelot said, <laughs> We had a, uh, a Weeblow, <laughs> if you don't know what a Weeblow is, a uh, very uneducated young Cub Scout who's just about to fly up, if you know what I'm saying. And uh, he was on one of our camp outs and he came up to me, he said, Scout Outs about, what is a, a hoo-ha? What is an all-purpose tool? A penis, if you will. Do we have any children in the audience? Are they old enough to hear this? And, uh, I said to him, I said, well, young Weeblo, a picture is worth a, a thousand words. So I whipped off my, my belt, my brass belt, and I dropped my pants, and I said, you know, that right there, that's a penis. And that is a perfect penis. So I said, 
Thanks, God, Master Bob. And he ran back to the other weebos and he said, he pulled down his pants and said, see that? That's penis. If I cut off three inches. <laughs> Well, as you know, if, if you've ever seen scouts, and I know that a lot of you being scouts tonight, you've seen them, and you know that we do a lot of fundraising. Now, what we do in Troop 30 is we take our three best scouts, our very, very finest, and we send them out to sell everything. We don't put the whole troop out there. We just get our best salesmen. We get John, and we get Tim, and we get Melvin. Now, this is how we found out that Melvin was such a great salesman. What we did is before we had him out there selling, you know, all the raffles and the, and the light bulbs and the donuts, we had him sell toothbrushes door to door, which is a hard thing to sell if you've ever tried to sell us. And Marvin, unfortunately, speaks with a lift, which we don't like to make fun of him because we treat every kid equally, but he speaks with a lift. So what we did is we sent him all out there the first day and we said, the one who sells the most, the most toothbrushes is going to be our top fundraiser. And that's quite an honor in Troop 30. So we sent him out the first day. Jack comes back. Let's see, was it Jack or was it, oh, who the hell cares? Jack and, and Tom come back and they sold. He said, Jack, how many did you sell? He said, 23, Scoutmaster Bob. He said, that's not bad. He said, Tom, how many did you sell? 42. Marvin, how many did you sell? I fried and I fried and I fried and I was very enthusiastic. I mean, I went out there talking to everybody. I couldn't stop nothing to do it. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Marvin. Tomorrow you're going to have a better day. So go out the next day and they sell their toothbrushes. They come back. It turns out that, uh, what's his name again? Tom? Dick? Harry? Tom sells 48. And Jack sells 69 toothbrushes. Marvin couldn't sell a single toothbrush once again. He fried. He was this low. He almost had a sale, but he couldn't. So the next day, the final day, we sent them all out there. Jack comes back. He sold. 104 toothbrushes door to door cold sailing. Now that's not bad. Tom sold 168. And I was almost afraid to ask, Marvin, how many did you sell? I sold 346 toothbrushes. I said, unbelievable. You are our top fundraiser. You gotta tell me how you did it though. He said, well, it was really very, very simple, Scout Master Bob. What I did is I got this big square pan, see, and I filled this square pan with cow shit. And I cut the cow shit into squares. <laughs> I went from four to four, and I said, excuse me, I'm giving away free samples of brownies. Would you like to try one? <laughs> and they did four. So they take a bite of blue that tastes like shit. And I tell you, I would you like to buy a toothbrush? <laughs> I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to leave you with a song uh, that we sing, that we sing hiking in Troop 30. Um, if I could get a G, thank you. <laughs> Be prepared. That's the Boy Scout marching song. Be prepared. As through life you go along, be prepared to hold your liquor pretty well. Don't write naughty words on walls if you can't spell. Be prepared to hide that pack of cigarette. Don't make book if you cannot cover bets. Be prepared to hide that reaper where you're sure it won't be found. And be careful not to smoke it when the Scoutmaster's around. For he only will insist that they be shared. Be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared! And be careful not to do your deed when there's no one watching you. And if you're looking for adventure of a new and different kind, and you come across a Girl Scout who is similarly inclined, <laughs> don't be nervous, don't be flustered, don't be scared. Be prepared. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Scott Master Bob. What a wonderful, edifying, edifying. presentation. <laughs> it was edifying. Now, what variety show would be complete without a really terrific male vocalist? I, I'm hoping for suggestions.
We're not going to let you down. We have our own Norm Bentley. We're going to do a beautiful rendition of a beautiful tune. You are so beautiful. Norm. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are glad to see
his partner, his business partner for 30 years, and he just walks over to them and he looks down at the guy and he says, Murray, I have to do this, but you. <laughs> now, the end. Well, our last act is uh, we're going to take you back to the Rhodes Palace, 30 AD, <laughs> and the famous Salome and the dance of the seven males, ladies and gentlemen. Salome!
your ticket stops for one half off on uh, Sorbet and Alba hair care products. Thanks to Jan Snow for her invaluable assistance in uh, bringing the show together. Also, Doug Bleeker. Is he here? Yes, he is. Where is he? Are you at the bar? You can join him at the bar later. Okay, great fellow, great fellow dog. The entire cast, here they are. Jennifer Greenkey on piano, of course, and the lovely and talented Phil Hamilton on drums. Please, yeah. but carefully the life you say, maybe mine.